Monsieur le commissaire européen chargé de la justice, Didier Renders, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, c'est un honneur, monsieur le commissaire, de vous accueillir aujourd'hui virtuellement à l'Institut d'études européennes de l'ULB pour un dialogue autour du thème de l'état de droit et des droits fondamentaux dans l'Union européenne qui se trouve au centre de l'actualité politique et médiatique en Europe. Je suis Ramona Coman, la présidente de l'Institut d'études européennes de l'ULB et je coordonne le module Jean Monnet, Rule of Law and Mutual Trust in Global and European Governance, financé par le programme Erasmus+, mais module qui vise à créer un cadre de dialogue entre la communauté académique et les décideurs politiques sur les enjeux que l'état de droit et la confiance mutuelle soulèvent. Our event today brings together participants from different institutions and organizations and mostly students, students from the Institute for European Studies and the ULB, as well as representatives of more than 200 students from five European universities, Universidad Autonoma Madrid, Bordeaux, Fulda and Universitat uh, van Amsterdam, students who over the last three weeks have been participating in the deliberative forum on the future of Europe organized by Professor Elena Garcia Gizian and Professor Luis Buza uh, from the University Autonoma Madrid as part of the Jean Monnet Network Open EU Debates Matching Politics with Policies. It is my great pleasure today to moderate this debate with Cecilia Riscala, generous postdoctoral researcher in European law at the ULB and the Université Saint-Louis, Bruxelles. Monsieur le Commissaire, dear colleagues, dear students, uh, please allow Cecilia and I to introduce the topic of our debate today. For long, the rule of law has been of interest mainly for academics and experts. Being an ideal and a principle of governance, it has come a long way in the scholarly debates since its first conceptualizations by Plato and Aristotle. Scholars of all persuasions, from legal studies to political theory and political science, have sought to shed light on its importance in modern society and on the meanings of this principle often equated with the ideal of equality before the law, fairness, legality, certainty, access to justice and rights, non-discrimination and prohibition of arbitrariness. Over the past decades, the promotion of the rule of law has received support for, of a wide range of actors, including not only states, but also international organizations, transnational networks, think tanks, epistemic communities, experts, and so on. The EU has been shaped by law. The progressive constitutionalization of values, including the rule of law since the 90s onwards, was meant to strengthen the EU's political identity. While the rule of law has generated consensus and support, it has become in recent years a bone of contention in European politics. Today, the consensus over values is more a myth rather than a reality, and this is what our Romone module on rule of law and mutual trust seeks to understand. To safeguard the rule of law over the last decades, EU institutions have developed a wide range of tools and instruments, and the Commission has played an active role, first in the enlargement process to support the transformation of candidate countries into member states, and more recently to assess the state of the rule of law in all EU member states. But over time, consensus over the rule of law has eroded. In recent years, as we know, new governments have come to power with the aim to dismantle the post-1989 political order. Elected, elected politicians who enjoy strong majorities in their parliaments contest the legitimacy of the EU and that of supranational institutions, such as the Commission, the Court of Justice and the European Parliament, which all took a stance in recent years, in the recent rule of law debates, to warn against the deterioration of rights and values. These governments seem keen to give what the people want by overriding constitutional principles in the name of sovereignty and above all in the name of a restrictive conception of the people. The tools developed EU level have not yet prevented some governments from democratic backsliding. 
too little, too late for some, too much, too soon for others. And in addition, as again, we all know, the mechanism linking the respect for rule of law to EU funds is what blocks these days the adoption of the EU's next seven years budget and the recovery package, which require unanimity and face the opposition of some governments. Now, the European Council meeting last week failed to convince Poland and Hungary to lift their veto on the 27 budget. Discussion don't appear to be going anywhere. But the German rotating presidency of the Council predicted the rule of law solution in base, and the president of the European Council expressed his optimism, saying that, I quote, the magic of the EU is succeeding in finding solutions even when you think it is impossible. Now, as scholars in EU studies and citizens, we have been following these developments closely, and we have many questions about the role of the Commission and of the Commissioner in charge of justice, but also maybe more pressing questions about how to find a compromise in the coming weeks to leave the blockade of some member states uh, on the 21-27 multi-annual financial framework and the recovery plan. And we all heard the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, confirming that the European institution is working with the German presidency to find a solution on conditionality and rule of law. In addition, challenges faced by the protection of the rule of law in Europe at national level have also come to our attention over the last few months. First, of course, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, the fight against the virus has indeed led to unprecedented restrictions linked to fundamental rights in Europe. These restrictions, or even derogations, have a very large scope ranging from the freedom of movement, the freedom of assembly, the right to private data protection, the right to education, the freedom of religion, etc. Most of them could, of course, be seen as pursuing, at least at first sight, a legitimate aim. Indeed, they aim at protecting the general interest, and in particular, several fundamental rights which are threatened by the pandemic, such as the right to health and the right to life, which include the duty to protect vulnerable groups. Their proportionality, or in other words, their adequacy and necessity, could nevertheless, in certain cases, be questioned. In particular, when we observe the diversity of measures taken by the different member states of the European Union. As a matter of fact, one can indeed wonder why the differences between national measures are so significant across the EU, while all member states are supposed to share the same values of Article 2 of the TU and are supposed to be bound by the principle of mutual trust. In addition to questioning the common values bringing EU member states together, the lack of coordination moreover threatens the efficiency of the fight against the virus in the European Union. Secondly, other events that arose in a few member states and which are not directly linked to the pandemic have also revived fears about the decline of the rule of law and fundamental rights in Europe. The questioning of several women's rights, the challenging of the freedom of expression and the freedom of the press, as on asylum seekers' human dignity, are part of the increasing number of events occurring in the member states which enter frontally in conflict with the founding values of the EU. If the respect of these values by the member states is a matter of interest for the EU, as underlined by Ramona, and even a condition of its viability, we all know that the EU faces significant difficulties to efficiently impose their implementation at national level. Some argue that the EU is not properly equipped to impose the respect of this value by the member states, while others rather emphasize the lack of political will at the national uh, level and at the level of EU institutions to act in this area. The discussion of today with the Commissioner for Justice, Didier Wenders, will undoubtedly shed light on this essential question by dealing with the Rule of Law Commission's uh, annual report the rule of law conditionality 
and the protection so, of fundamental rights question. in the context of uh, the COVID-19. The Commissioner is indeed in charge, among others, of the responsibility of ensuring the rule of law in the EU, deepening the cooperation with international organizations such as the Council of Europe, enforcing data protection, and developing judicial cooperation between member states, which directly depends on the sharing of common values. Before joining the Commission, Didier Renders served as Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, and Minister of Finance in Belgium, and as a colleague of us as Professor at the Department of Political Science at the ULB. Monsieur le Commissaire Renders, nous vous remercions de votre présence à notre débat. The floor is yours. Ben, merci beaucoup tout d'abord de, de votre invitation. Thank, thank you very much for. Microphone uh, the... is not activated. Le micro. Uh, oh, it's... Normally, yes, but. Yes, we hear you well. Yeah, do you, you hear? You, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes, non, je disais simplement merci beaucoup de votre invitation. Thank you for your invitation. C'est un plaisir de pouvoir parler de, de l'état de droit avec vous cet après-midi et en, en profitant de cette occasion pour vous présenter notamment le premier rapport sur l'état de droit dans les 27 États membres de l'Union européenne que j'ai eu l'occasion de coordonner et que nous avons présenté avec la Commission en septembre dernier. C'est aussi l'occasion d'échanger évidemment des points de vue sur des sujets importants. Vous en avez mentionné quelques-uns. Et je crois que c'est important qu'avec des étudiants et des universitaires, on voit que beaucoup d'acteurs euh, s'engagent dans le, le domaine des valeurs fondamentales et de, de l'état de droit en particulier. Je vous dirais que c'est ce que nous souhaitons pouvoir faire, notamment avec ce rapport annuel, c'est réellement mener un débat sur l'état de droit en associant les citoyens de toute l'Union et pas seulement les États membres. So I, I want maybe to start to say that the rule of law, uh, like democracy and fundamental rights, uh, is one of the values on which uh, the Union is founded. You have mentioned the Article 2 of the Treaty. Of course, it's uh, the important element. Last about the open way of life, and to my mind, the open way of life is the Article 2. It's a full respect for uh, democracy, uh, fundamental rights, and, and the rule of law. And the rule of law is of fundamental importance because it guarantees the protection of all other values, including democracy and respect for fundamental rights. Moreover, the rule of law plays a crucial role for the functioning of the EU. And you have insist on the trust. It's true. It's indeed essential for mutual trust, which enables effective judicial cooperation in civil and commercial and criminal matters between member states. Uh, the rule of law is also important for the effective functioning of the internal market and for business and investment environment. So it's a real question of trust between the member states, between the businesses, but also between the citizens of the European Union. And we want to show that we are able to share the same value and to work on the same basis. Uh, again, a democratic process, a full respect for fundamental rights, and a real application of the rule of law. And the ongoing uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has further highlighted the importance of the rule of law. It was a real resilience test of the rule of law in the different member states. And fortunately, respect for taken for granted, even within the EU. And over the past years, we have seen rule of law concerns emerging in certain member states. In another capacity, if you have mentioned that, I have started in 2016 in the Geneva Council with some colleagues to ask to organize with you on the rule of law at the level of the Council, because it was not a tradition to discuss on the rule of law. We have had many discussions on the budgetary situation of the Member States, on structural reforms, like about the pension schemes, but not about the rule of law and the values. And at the same moment in 2016, we have seen some proposals coming from the Parliament in the same way to organise a debate. So it's quite recent. Uh, like we have reinforced uh, the mechanism about the budgetary situation after the bank crisis and the sovereign debt crisis is very important to uh, do the same about the rule of law and the values uh, because we have a sort of crisis for the moment. We have seen that in the European Union about the, the rule of law and I want to insist on this because if we don't organize the business at home, if we don't organize the real protection of the rule of law at home in the European Union, it's very difficult to be credible side of the when we want to sort of discuss about democratic process, fundamental rights, and the rule of law. And these developments 
have only made the Commission also more convinced of the importance of using all the instruments at its disposal to uphold the rule of law. Therefore, the Commission has gradually developed and used during the last years a variety of instruments to address these challenges. And the Commission has set up now a yearly cycle with the rule of law report at its heart. Uh, the mechanism is conceived as a yearly process during which we aim to prevent problems from emerging or deepening. It will create joint awareness on the situation of the rule of law across the European Union and keep this topic high on the political agenda. It will stimulate a permanent discussion on the rule of law year after year. As from now, the Commission will every year issue a report on the rule of law situation in the whole Union. What we want to achieve through this mechanism is a deeper dialogue to foster a rule of law culture in all the member states. We need such a dialogue at EU level, but also at national level. We are doing to, to organize all the, the member states. We now have the information on the table to bring the discussion to a new stage. Now, let me say a few words about the first edition of the annual rule of law report. Uh, the report provides a synthesis of significant rule of law developments in the uh, European Union as a whole, as well as country specific assessments for all the 27 member states. It is based on a variety of sources, including written inputs from the member states, stakeholder contributions, and reports and documents from the Council of Europe or other expert bodies. The report describes evolutions since the beginning of 2019. It also reflects developments concerning emergency measures adopted in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic were relevant. What we want to achieve through this report is a deeper dialogue on the rule of law at both EU and national level by having open debates and by exchanging best practices. We want to build again a rule of law culture and make EU citizens better aware of what the rule of law actually means for them in their daily life. This takes me to the content of the report itself, which um, examines four key areas. The, the independence, quality and efficiency of justice systems, the anti-corruption framework, media pluralism and media freedom, and other institutional uh, checks and balances. Firstly, on the independence of and quality and efficiency of justice uh, systems. Uh, a number of member states are making efforts to strengthen uh, judicial independence and reduce the influence of the executive or legislative powers over the judiciary. But judicial independence remains an issue of concern in certain member states. For example, as regards the capacity of councils for the judiciary to exercise their functions. We have also more structural concerns of an increase of the executive and legislative branches on the functioning of the justice systems, uh, including constitutional courts and supreme courts. In terms of quality of justice, the current pandemic has highlighted uh, the importance to accelerate the digitalization of justice, to go to e-justice. Many initiatives are ongoing to deliver improvements, and some justice systems are already well equipped with the technology to operate remotely, investing in justice is more necessary than ever. And I've asked to all the Ministers of Justice uh, to take care of the fact that in the recovery plan that uh, they will propose to the EU level to receive some support from the, uh, uh, the EU budget, it is, will be very important to put emphasis on the uh, digitalization of the public services and certainly digitalization of the justice system. Let me now move to the, the anti-corruption framework. Several member states have recently adopted new comprehensive anti-corruption strategies or revised existing ones. What will, however, be key is that these strategies are effectively implemented and monitored to ensure that progress is made on the ground. Our monitoring shows concerns in several member states of the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of corruption cases. 
This includes concerns that high-level corruption cases are not systematically pursued. And I will say some words maybe about the fact that for the first time now, we will start also some uh, investigations and prosecutions from the EU level, because I'm also in charge to install in the next months uh, the European Public Prosecutor Office. And it will be an important tool to find against abuses, frauds and corruption cases in the way to use the European budget. Unfortunately, we are doing that with 22 member states, not, not with all. It's a, a voluntary uh, approach. And of course, we have, again, uh, some uh, contact to the opting, classical opting out in criminal uh, uh, measures like uh, Ireland, Sweden or Denmark, but we have also Poland and Hungary out of the game. Thirdly, uh, on media pluralism and media freedom, an encouraging finding is that the independence of uh, media authorities is enshrined in law in every member state. That being said, there are worrying signs in some of them with regards to the political influence on the media, a lack of transparency when it comes to media ownership, and risk to journalists and other media actors. Not only the murders of some journalists in the last years, but also attacks, also injustice, with the so-called slabs, different kind of actions to push pressure on the journalists. And the first area of the report concerns institutional checks and balances. On the positive side, again, there is a healthy debate in some member states on strengthening a rule of law culture. Also, new channels for citizens to challenge the exercise of executive and legislative power in a number of member states is to be welcomed. The cooperation with international experts bodies, such as the Venice Commission, can contribute to ensure that reforms will comply with European standards. Across the EU, Civil society continues to be a key actor in defending the rule of law. However, in some member states, it operates in an unstable environment and is facing challenges, such as legislation challenging access to foreign or smear campaign about the financing coming from uh, foreign countries. We have uh, organized some uh, infringement proceedings before the Court of Justice in the way to uh, uh, push pressure on the fact that it must be possible to organize a funding also from abroad. And again, it was uh, important to go to the court with a specific case about Hungary in such a, in such a way. Of course, I said in the beginning that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a range of challenges for societies, including for the EU's fundamental values. And the Commission has been actively monitoring the emergency measures taken in all member states. All member states have, be, have taken exceptional measures to protect public health, resulting in restrictions on certain fundamental uh, uh, rights. And it's normal to do that. And we have uh, agreed on the fact that it was logical to take some initiative. Most member states have declared a form of emergency or have put in place measures to rapidly address the health emergency. The Commission has insisted from the outset that responses to the crisis must respect our fundamental values as set out in the treaties. In particular, emergency measures should be limited to what is necessary, strictly proportionate, clearly limited in time, and in line with constitutional guarantees as well as European inter international standards. Moreover, governments must ensure that these measures are subject to regular parliamentary scrutiny in full respect of democratic powers. And so we need to have a real oversight by the justice systems in all the member states. And sometimes we have seen reactions of courts and tribunals against different measures. We have seen a real oversight by the parliament, but there are also discussions about the situation in some member states in the way to have a real oversight, not only by the justice system, by the parliaments, but also sometimes by the civil society and by the press. The COVID-19 pandemic has provided good examples of functioning uh, uh, checks and balances. Parliamentary scrutiny helped frame certain emergency response, and these measures were often reviewed by national courts. However, again, we also identified a number of concerns with regard to checks and balances. In a few member states, we see repeated 
recourse to expedited legislation in, in Parliament or to emergency ordinances from the government, and their situations raise concerns. The resilience of the justice system was also, was also put uh, to the test, the same kind of test than all other institutions. A number of member states have taken measures to reduce the impact of the pandemic and were able to restart hearings applying distancing rules or video conferencing techniques. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic showed the importance of accelerating reforms to digitalize the handling of cases by the judicial institutions, the exchange of information and documents with parties and lawyers, and the continued and easy access to justice for all. Now, let me say maybe a few words about the general regime of conditionality for the protection of the union budget, because we have a, a toolbox with different uh, instruments at our disposal uh, to try to uh, uh, have a very good discussion about the rule of law in a preventive way with some uh, actions before the Court of Justice, also with the Article 7 of the treaty, uh, if it's needed to organize a debate on the Council level on this. Uh, but we need to do more. And that was the idea since 2018. In 2018, the Commission submitted a proposal for a regulation on the protection of the union budget in the event of shortcomings in the uh, rule of law in the member states. The new rules proposed uh, would provide the union with tools to protect its efficiencies in the member states, undermine or treat to undermine the financial interest of the union. Uh, the annual rule of law report could be used, among other sources, to assess the situation of the rule of law in the member states. However, the Commission will need to carry out an autonomous assessment of whether the, tri the triggering criteria of the regulation are met. The Commission has been strongly advocating for this mechanism to, put, to be uh, put in, in place. Now, trilogues between the Parliament, the Council and the Commission have led to a provisional agreement which the Commission welcomes. It is now important to get a swift adoption by the co-legislators, and you have seen that it was possible to reach a qualified majority at the Council level about this. So we have a qualified majority at the Council level, we have a real support in the Parliament, and also the support of the Commission, because it was already, I said, a proposal of the Commission since 2018. So I want to say maybe that, uh, of course, it's an important year for the rule of law, because we have uh, published the first annual report, with uh, an equal treatment of all the member states. We are now in an important discussion about the conditionality in relation with the budget, the MFF, but also the next generation AU, a real capacity to organize the recovery and the resilience if we are going out of the pandemic, thanks to the vaccines, maybe in the next months. But I must say that it was a very difficult year because uh, it was uh, like this video organized uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also a year when we discuss uh, all the time with our UK uh, colleagues about the Brexit, and we continue to discuss about the Brexit. And of course, uh, now we try to see how it's possible to, uh, uh, to have a real agreement uh, to start next year with a real budget and with a real new capacity for the uh, European Commission to, to work with a, a capacity to spend, I uh, insist on this, more money, faster, and with more flexibility. So if we are doing that, we need to organize a real protection of the budget. On one side, again, as I said, fraud, abuses and corruption cases, thanks to the EPPO, the European Public Prosecutor Office, but also against many possible deficiencies in the rule of law uh, in different member states. Et je voudrais terminer en vous disant que c'est un moment évidemment important, comme on le fait aujourd'hui, de, de débattre de, de l'état de droit. Je tente de le faire au Conseil. Nous avons déjà eu un débat général sur l'état de droit au Conseil pendant la présidence allemande, et puis un débat sur cinq premiers États membres, par ordre protocolaire, la Belgique, la Bulgarie, la République tchèque, mais également l'Estonie et le Danemark. On abordera le dossier allemand dans la présidence portugaise, mais on va continuer, sous les présidences suivantes, à faire cet examen. J'ai eu un débat au Parlement européen, mais nous avons aussi un un débat devant les parlements nationaux. Et donc c'est important maintenant que le rapport est adopté, 
on puisse réellement franchir de nouvelles étapes. Et je voudrais dès lors vous dire que ce que nous mettons en place, c'est donc un dialogue, je l'ai dit plusieurs fois, approfondi sur l'état de droit et installer une véritable culture de l'état de droit dans l'Union européenne, avec le Parlement, avec le, le Conseil, mais aussi avec les parlements nationaux et les acteurs de la société civile. Et donc, autant il est important de discuter, je l'ai dit au début, des budgets avec tous les États membres, d'échanger sur les réformes structurelles qui doivent avoir lieu, mais il faut aussi pouvoir débattre de l'État de droit. Et la volonté est vraiment là. Je vous disais, le 13 octobre, nous avons eu un débat général au Conseil, sous présidence allemande. Le 17 novembre, ce débat sur les cinq premiers États que j'ai mentionnés, nous allons continuer avec les présidences suivantes, portugaises, slovènes. Nous allons continuer aussi le tour des parlements. J'ai commencé avec le Bundestag, euh, j'ai poursuivi avec le, le parlement danois, euh, où nous avons eu aussi un débat sur l'état de droit. J'aurai l'occasion de, de discuter encore dans plusieurs parlements nationaux avant la fin de cette année, quatre ou cinq, mais nous continuerons dès le début de, de l'année prochaine, parce qu'il est important qu'on puisse continuer à voir comment... Euh, euh, les différents parlements nationaux réagissent au rapport que nous diffusons. Notre but, c'est que les parlements nationaux, comme les gouvernements, nous disent quelles mesures on envisage pour répondre aux préoccupations qui sont émises dans le rapport sur euh, l'état de droit. Et nous continuons de suivre de près aussi l'application des mesures prises dans la pratique, bien entendu, en matière d'état de droit, avec euh, cette pandémie qui continue à être là, et dans laquelle on doit vérifier que les droits fondamentaux sont effectivement protégés, que ce qui est fait est fait, je disais, de manière proportionnée et dans la limite de ce qui est nécessaire. C'est un élément important, l'impact sur le droit de l'Union est aussi une préoccupation qui est, qui est la nôtre. Et je peux vous confirmer que dans son rôle de gardienne des traités, la Commission continuera à prendre toutes les initiatives nécessaires. Ce que je viens de vous présenter, ce sont des outils supplémentaires. Ça ne nous empêche pas de continuer à aller de la Cour de justice, par exemple, lorsque nous estimons qu'il y a des infractions aux droits euh, de l'Union. Et nous continuerons à suivre les mesures actuelles d'urgence, notamment, jusqu'à ce qu'elles soient révoquées, jusqu'à ce qu'on soit sorti de euh, la pandémie. Je crois que l'engagement commun pour l'État de droit est vraiment un engagement très important dans, dans cette période au sein de l'Union. Je uh, just want to conclude, to say, of course, I'm very open to... Uh, also to your questions, to receive your proposals, maybe, because again, it's uh, with the rule of law report, it's a real intention to organize such a kind of debate and to organize a real participation, because it's very important also to show that when we are discussing about the rule of law, we are also discussing about the daily life of the citizens. If you have to go to justice, you need to go to an independent, and if it's possible, a qualified judge. And that's very important. If, if we have some concern, about uh, the independence of a uh, constitutional, uh, constitutional tribunal, to give an example. Of course, just to have a, a discussion about the legal issue, it's also because there are some consequences. I want to, to stop to say that you have seen since some weeks many demonstrations in one member state about the right for abortion of the woman. But of course, it's a real concern about the right of the woman But it's a real concern about the rule of law, again, because we have challenged uh, the independence of the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland since some months, also before the Court of Justice. So there is a link between independence of justice and some uh, real debate in the society. But thanks again for this opportunity to present the rule of law report, but I'm open, of course, to discuss on other issues. It's with pleasure that I respond to your questions on other themes, of course, touching the state of law, if you so Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Commissaire, pour cette intervention tout à fait passionnante et stimulante et qui nous a notamment éclairé sur les coulisses de la protection de l'État de droit et qui a rappelé l'importance tout à fait fondamentale de l'indépendance de la justice comme garant des autres droits fondamentaux, en fait. Uh, so we open the floor now for questions and comments, both in French and in English. We have already several questions that we received in advance, and so we will give them a priority. But uh, do not hesitate during the first round of questions to ask more questions in uh, the chat box. Yes, so as Cecilia said, please, I see already some hands uh, raised, so please don't hesitate to write your questions uh, in the chat box. 
but uh, as we said, we will give preference to the questions that we received in advance. And first of all, I'm very happy to see several colleagues attending this discussion, not only from ULB, but also from other universities in Europe. Now, for the first round of questions, if you, um, uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Luis Buza from the University Autonoma Madrid who coordinates uh, one of the Jean uh, network, uh, which is uh, participating to this discussion, open EU debate. Uh, Professor Bouza, you have the floor. Merci, Professor Coman. Uh, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le, le Commissaire, for uh, votre intervention. I will switch to English, uh, also for the sake of some of our Madrid-based students. Um, thank you very much for the for the lecture. That was very interesting. Um, we have been discussing on the Conference on the Future of Europe with uh, students from Madrid, Brussels, Bordeaux, and Fulda, as I mentioned at the beginning. And one of the issues that we are discussing is uh, participatory democracy. Now, we have looked at the um, uh, national consultations exercise back from 2018 and 19. Uh, by the way, and I think uh, the, the Belgian uh, document, for instance, was really uh, interesting, and I think you were a member of the, the government that was involved in that, so just uh, my congratulations on that. Now, our question is, uh, looking at the concerns about um, democracy, about rule of law in different member states, should not um, the European Union, and specifically the Conference on the Future of Europe, come up with a sort of uh, common minimum guidelines on what to expect what to expect uh, from um, member states in terms of uh, participatory democracy? What do we consider minimum um, in order to validate cons national consultations as genuine participatory exercises? Thank you very much. And I would propose to take a second question from Alvaro Oleart, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Alvaro, you have the floor. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, uh, Professor uh, Kuman, and, and thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Reinders for your very interesting lecture. Um, uh, my question uh, complements a little bit what, uh, what uh, my, my colleague Luis just said. So discussions surrounding the rule of law have been posed uh, mainly from a legal perspective until now. Uh, however, it is clear that there is a political logic to it that is, uh, however, often summarized in the public sphere as a confrontation between uh, a member state and the EU, leaving little space to uh, domestic actors not represented by the government uh, in question who might be in fact supportive of uh, the role for the EU um, in, in terms of uh, rule of law. So my question is, how can the European Commission effectively address rule of law violations while also moving away from a more legalistic path, thereby encouraging a more European, um, uh, European public sphere, a more healthy political debate around it? Thanks a lot. Monsieur le Commissaire, est-ce que nous pouvons prendre d'autres questions ou on s'arrête ici pour le premier tour et puis nous pouvons continuer avec d'autres questions Les étudiants sont aussi euh, oh, demandeurs. Non, non, on peut peut-être prendre ce, ce premier tour, mais je vais essayer de répondre dans la même langue que la question. Ça sera plus facile pour moi. For everybody. First of all, about uh, the future of Europe. Of course, it will be very important in the conference and the future of Europe to discuss about uh, uh, the possible change in the treaties, maybe some uh, new elements to be sure that it's possible to have a real protection of the rule of law, the democracy, and the fundamental rights uh, in the European Union. But to be very concrete, uh, we are doing the job normally when we assess um, the, the, the situation in some countries for the accession to the uh, European Union. But the difference is that about the uh, budgetary situation, we continue to monitor that, about the Maastricht criteria. But when you look to the Copenhagen criteria and the reference to the more political analyze, it seems to be that if you enter in the European Union, it's done and it's granted. You don't have any concern about the, the evolution uh, in relation with the rule of law, the democracy and the fundamental rights. And it's not true, I've said, it's not granted. It's possible to have some changes everywhere, in Europe, in the US, in other parts of the world. It's all the time possible to have different kind of evolutions. And so it's very important to continue, of course, to see what is possible to do in France in the future of Europe, but also to prove now that we have some tools to uh, act about the rule of law. And it's the reason why uh, the annual report is so important to my mind. And uh, maybe also the more uh, other tools uh, to try to stop 
the, the evolution in different member states, like the uh, different pos uh, proceedings before the Court of Justice, but also now maybe the new instruments about the conditionality. And it's true that it's needed to, to do that not only on a legal basis, basis. It's the reason why I said, to give an example, in some fields, we have a good legislation in some member states. But if you read the, the annual report, the first one uh, adopted in September, uh, you will see that we have said, of course, we have a real protection of the media pluralism enshrined in the law. But we have seen concerns about a correct implementation of such a protection uh, in the reality. Uh, we have seen a real new framework about the fight against corruption, but how it's possible to implement such a framework. So we try, first of all, to go further than the law and to see what are the different situations in the member states in the implementation of the law in the reality of the uh, uh, media prevalence fight against corruption or independence of the judiciary is the reason why we have taken the decision also uh, in many of this year to go to the court of justice about the disciplinary procedures against the judges in poland to ask to the court to take interim measures to stop the process and we continue to work on it but you're right um, we need to do that not only with the different governments uh, in a discussion between the different capitals and uh, the EU and the Commission, and not only with the EU, EU institutions, the Council, where we have again the government and the European Parliament. The reason why we try to do that, I said, with uh, discussions in the national parliaments, with the civil societies, but just to give to conclude the example of the preparatory works of the annual reports, we have worked with a contact group, a network of contact persons from the 27 member states, and we have received contributions and reactions from the member states. But we have received also 200 written contributions from different stakeholders, from the Council of Europe uh, or the Venice Commission, but also from uh, uh, organizations at the EU level, association of judges or Supreme Court and others, but also association at the national level and NGOs at the national level. And we have organized country visits, of course, by video, but that means 300 different videos in the different member states with not only the authorities, the government, the justice system, but also many national actors coming from the civil society. And it's very important to continue to do that and to go more to the a real discussion inside the different member states to install, I said, a real culture of the rule of law and to make the link between the rule of law and the different principles and the reality on the ground. What that means for the citizens to have a correct and the full respect of the rule of law in one country. And what that means to have some breaches to the rule of law. That's very important. And uh, we count on the support of many uh, actors to explain more and more what is it, because it seems to be far from the citizens uh, in some situations. I, I said the disciplinary procedure against the judges, it seems to be just a problem for the judge. It's not true. It's also a problem for the citizens and for the businesses and for all the different actors. Merci. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. So uh, I propose now to uh, move to the second round of question that we received of our students, and I propose them so to to pose them in a row, and so after, if it's okay for you, uh, Mr. Renders, you could answer to them uh, uh, okay. together. So I have uh, questions from uh, Yasmin Bayens, Irina uh, Betancourt. Julia Fernandez and Marguerite Mandola. The floor is yours. Um, maybe I will start off. Um, can you hear me all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Renders. Thank you for speaking for us today. Um, Irina and I, we have uh, questions regarding the rule of law conditionality on the EU seven years budget. So uh, the Commission is obviously seeking to put an end to the rule of law systemic crisis by putting this rule of law conditionality. My first question uh, about this is twofold. First, why is a new rule of law mechanism pushed when actually Article 6 of the Common Provision Regulation of 2013 already regulates the European Structural and Investment Funds and explicitly requires government to ensure already that the use of EU funds uh, does comply with union law? Secondly, um, Hever uh, calls for the circumvention of the veto of Poland and Hungary 
by using the mechanism of enhanced cooperation. Um, what do you think about this, Mr. Renders? And um, might this not be counterproductive on the long term, given uh, the fact that the EU cre EU's credibility is not as high um, due to its double standards um, towards human rights protection? And also, might other member states get scared that they will be set aside one day when this um, enhanced cooperation mechanism becomes an established practice. So these are my questions. Um, uh, Irina has um, questions on uh, a similar topic. Thank you. Bonsoir, Monsieur Renders. Je voudrais vous remercier pour votre présence ici aujourd'hui avec nous et votre présentation par rapport à la protection de l'état des droits, un sujet d'importance et d'urgence pour le futur du projet européen. Um, I will continue in English. So, my question is related to our Article 7. So, the Commission activated Article 7 against Poland in 2017, and the Parliament initiated it against Hungary in 2018. Observers have warned about the possibility of rally round flag effects emerging due to the, its activation and therefore increasing the support for domestic actors that EU intervention is supposed to weaken. And while the Commission reframed from acting against Hungary, it did against the Polish government. So I have two questions regarding this. Was this decision based on the study of potential unintended consequences? For instance, the possibility of um, diminishment of the Commission's legitimacy to protect the rule of law at the supranational level due to the lack of unanimity uh, at the Council. And the second one is, could the rule of law conditionality also trigger a rally around the flag effect in Poland and Hungary, increasing the support of the ruling parties? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hender. Julia Fernandez there, maybe to pose it to her question. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, Mr. Reinders, for being here with us today. My question is the following. Do you think that the rule of law conditionality just agreed upon in the trilogues could lead to a rise of your skepticism in the countries affected? And if so, uh, what is the Commission going to do to try to prevent it? Thank you very much. And the last question to Marguerite Mandola. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anders, for being here with us. It's like for more, for many of us, it's a very personal uh, issue. This rule of law. So um, I wanted to ask you, as it joins the previous question, don't you think that the lack of the action will, um, from the from the par from the side of your institution, will not only increase the euro skepticism but maybe disappoint euro enthusiasts? And um, uh, yes, only yesterday, Ursula von der Leyen she said, "It's enough with the lies." Il faut arrêter les mensonges because your euro citizens are waiting for the for the budget are waiting for the financial help and of course it was blocked by poland and hungary and the two <coughs> countries they don't hesitate to switch the situation and to um to accuse even to slander a european union in in the eyes of the citizens so um just just to give you like yeah some examples so 87% of Polish people are for the UE, support the European Union. But when they are asked, almost half of them support the, the veto uh, of the budget from the Polish government only because of the negative propaganda. So, so just to resume my question, yes, don't you think that that will disappoint Euro enthusiasts? Thank you very much. Maybe a reaction of all those questions first. Uh, first of all, maybe on the technical point of view, if I may, or the legal point of view, why uh, a new uh, mechanism? Uh, we try to organize such a mechanism for all the financial instruments. So it's not dedicated to uh, the MFF or to another one, but we are coming now with a recovery and resilience facility. It's also with a, a rule of law mechanism inside. So we try to have a, a real uh, reaction, possible reaction to all the different aspects of the uh, funding of different policies at the EU level. That's the first element. And this is the reason why we have for the moment a discussion about the MFF, but also the next generation EU. And you know that uh, about the MFF, if we don't have an agreement, uh, it's possible to work on the basis of the uh, uh, limitation of 2020 in 2021, like we are doing at the, at the national level in many member states. But about the next generation, hey, you, the 750 uh, 
uh, new billions that we want to spend uh, faster and with more flexibility, and we want to go to the market uh, with green bonds uh, for one third to finance that. Of course, we need to, to uh, have a, a real decision now uh, at the EU level. And in fact, you, you mentioned the reference to the, the situation some years ago about uh, a specific uh, a digital treaty about the budgetary situation. I was Minister of Finance, and so I, had, uh, I took part in the discussions to organize a process with 25th member states. At that time, without uh, Croatia, they were not yet a uh, member of the European Union, but without on the 27th of time, without the UK and Czech Republic. But it was a specific situation. Now, what is at stake? Uh, we tried to have an agreement first. So the pressure now is uh, to convince the two member states. I want to insist on the fact it's true that there are some uh, um, studies or polls to show, to show that there's maybe a support of 50% of the population in Poland for the veto. But so that means that there are so 50% against. So it's a first step. It's a, it's a good element to see that it's a real debate. And we need maybe to increase the debate at the national level in all the member states, but certainly now in those two countries. Uh, what is possible to, to do? But first of all, we don't want to move on the conditionality. It's very clear from the Commission, but also from the Parliament. It's very clear. And I'm sure that is the position of many members in the Council. So the only one way is to convince the two member states that it's needed to agree on such a, a new conditionality. Why? But because it's needed to give some uh, new support to the most affected member states, but also citizens and businesses in the entire European Union, and certainly in the most affected countries. Uh, and we try to do that with the next generation EU as with the new financing. But I must say that all is on the table. If it's possible to have a success uh, with Poland and Hungary and to have an agreement on all, we will do that. If it's not, we need to think about different kind of solutions. I have just recalled some days ago that it's possible in some situation to work with a, a limited number of member states. Because, again, I was there for the budgetary uh, discussions with 25th member states. But if you look to Schengen, if you look to uh, the functioning of the Eurogroup, uh, it was all the time with something else than the treaties. And then in the Lisbon Treaty, it was possible to take on board the evolutions. But we are not so far. For the moment, the situation is that we need to see if it's possible for the rotating presidencies or the German presidency, and to be very concrete, first of all, for the chancellor, to find a way to have an agreement with uh, Poland and, and Hungary. But it's not exactly a compromise, because on the condition, condition it is not a compromise. It's to apply the new uh, mechanism, and then to see how it's possible to do that with certain guarantee. We have repeated that, of course, it will be an independent and impartial analysis and assessment by the Commission. And if we are going to the Council, of course, like for all the decisions of the Council, it's possible to challenge that in the rule of law process before the Court of Justice if you have some doubts. So we want to work like in the uh, annual report on the rule of law on a very independent uh, uh, work method and with the capacity to be really uh, impartial. So, in fact, you ask uh, a sort of question about, it was from Pina, I'm sure, about the Article 7 and the procedure. Of course, we are knowing that we have a real problem in the Article 7 uh, with the uh, uh, rules about the procedure and the majorities and unanimity sometimes that it's required. But it's a huge debate. It's the reason why I said we welcome the agreement on the conditionality. You know that in the proposal of 2018, the Commission put on the table the reverse qualified majority, like in the uh, macroeconomic policy and the European semester and the recommendation of the Commission in the different member states. But we are knowing then to move from unanimity to qualified majority and maybe then to a reverse qualified majority, it's a very difficult debate. So we welcome the decision to have a broader scope about the conditionality and to work with the qualified majority because it must be possible to reach a qualified majority at the council level. And uh, again, it's that maybe the most important element now that it's possible to move uh, with a real mechanism without unanimity and with a real possibility for the Commission to come with an assessment and this time to have an effect. I want just to mention the fact that the Article 7 is also useful because it's a permanent pressure, a political pressure. We have seen some change. In, to give an example, in Hungary, it was possible to stop some reforms about the uh, administrative jurisdictions. 
And if we have seen sometimes different kind of evolutions in Hungary and in Poland in relation with the discussion, but it's more a political pressure at the level of council. And then uh, here we want to have a more uh, efficient mechanism. But it's true that with such a mechanism, uh, uh, it was raised by Julia, uh, we need to take care of the f final beneficiaries. Because, and we have discussed that in the, the different discussions with the, uh, the member states and in the trilogue with the parliament. Because if we have some concern about the situation of the rule of law in one of the 27 member states uh, with an impartial vision, uh, it's very important to ask maybe to suspend some funding of policies. But the goal is not to have a sanction on the fi uh, final beneficiaries. To give an example, uh, if we need to suspend the uh, agriculture policy, it's not to uh, stop the financing of the farmers, or, uh, certainly not on all the farmers, maybe to stop some kind of selection at the national level. But we want to, to protect the final the final beneficiaries. And to do that, we have different methods, uh, maybe to impose to the member state to continue to finance that, or to organize a direct financing from the EU level to the final beneficiaries, directly by the Commission, or through some outsourcing of such a capacity to different actors. So there are different ways, and we have had very good discussions, and with my colleague, the Commissioner in charge for the budget, Gioan, it was very important to discuss that with the Parliament and the Council. So we try to protect the final uh, beneficiaries. And again, to go back to uh, the discussion about uh, uh, the situation in some member states, you said uh, uh, you, there's a support for the veto in, in some member states uh, for the moment. There are some uh, euroscepticism. To fight against euroscepticism and to fight against populism also, you know, more general uh, uh, approach, we need, of course, to think about new instruments like the conditionality to have new instruments maybe in the conference on the future of Europe. But we need, first of all, to prove that we are able at the EU level to come with more concrete and efficient solutions in different specific situations. You know that we try to do that with a migration pact about migration. We have a crisis and we have had a huge crisis in 2015. We try to enhance our capacity to act together about the security issue due to the terrorist attacks in 15, in 16, but also in the last months in Austria or in France. But to give an example, we try also to show now that in some fields, it's better to have a real competence at the EU level. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I've seen so many criticism about the lack of action at the EU level, but we don't have a competence, a real competence in herbs. And you have seen that we have proved that it's possible to build a competence in herbs sector. And due to uh, the different action from President of the Commission, my colleague uh, Stella Kirikides in charge of herbs, now we are very close to have new vaccines. But why? Because the Commission has decided to invest a lot of money in the research about the vaccines. We'll have an agreement of the uh, um, agency, the health agency and the medicine agency at the EU level about the vaccines. And we have uh, taken the decision to organize some contracts with the different firms. And it's due to that that it'd be possible for the member states to receive the vaccines. And it's the same for the test. And now we try to enhance the possibility to work with the medicine agency at the EU level, with the CDC, the Center for Disease, to, to have, I said before, a single uh, map uh, with the same colors for all the countries, so to organize a coordination. And I'm sure that during the pandemic, there are more and more people thinking that it's better for some part of the policy to work at the EU level and to organize a cooperation. It's impossible to do all at the EU level. But again, and it's true for health, it's true for migration, it's true for security, it's true for many other policies. And so there's a, a balanced approach. I'm sure that it's impossible to find against uh, some populism or, or euroscepticism just with legal procedures and uh, new mechanisms. It's important to have such a kind of mechanism to protect the rule of law, the fundamental rights and the democracy. But we need also to show that we have some reserves in the daily life of the citizens. And during the pandemic, of course, if it's possible to come in the next months with vaccines and with a real uh, uh, a reason to do that by the action of the Commission, it will be uh, more significant maybe than many other kind of uh, 
actions at the EU level. So the real concrete policy is very important, not only, but it's very important to convince that it's useful to, to be part of a union. And if I may, in the Brexit is one of our concerns. We need to show, after the Brexit, we want to have an agreement, of course, and we try to work on it. But we want to be sure that it's possible to show that it's better to be member of the European Union than to be out. We need to explain that there is an added value to be member of the club. And if you are going out, of course, it's possible to have close relations, but not with the same added value than as a member of the club. And that is also very important to show the difference to the citizens. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Commissaire. Si vous êtes d'accord, nous avons reçu encore une série de questions par les, de la part des, des collègues et des étudiants qui, qui nous suivent. Uh, I will now give the floor maybe to first Ismery Gomer Barbier and then Laura Schmeier, uh, Simone Rivabella and Sibel Top. Uh, Ismery, à vous la parole. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much, first of all, for uh, this presentation. It was really interesting. And my question is related to the uh, Loi de Sécurité Globale, who just passed in France two days ago. Um, this is one of the law that has a really big salience right now in France, and especially at the European level as well. I just wanted to know what is your position on this law, knowing that it could be a threat for uh, the rule of law in the EU, and knowing that France is one of the, the mother of the EU. This doesn't sound really good for us. <laughs> Thank you. Merci, Ismery. Uh, Laura? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for uh, your presentation. Uh, you already already mentioned this briefly in your presentation uh, that for uh, fighting uh, corruption in the EU, the European Public Prosecutor's Office should play a crucial role. And I was wondering if you could maybe <coughs> elaborate a bit on um, what role you foresee exactly for uh, the EPPO in um, the fight against corruption, especially considering the fact that Hungary and Poland do not participate in this enhanced cooperation. Thank you. And for the last two questions, so Sibel Top and then Simone Rivabella. Um, hello, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I would have a question about mutual trust. I understand your present the fact that now the budget, the the budget is tied to a certain extent to the respect of the rule of law. For me, it's a great step forward because there are deficiencies and an acknowledgement of these deficiencies is important to move forward. But it also calls uh, the mutual trust principle uh, in to, into question to a certain extent. So I would uh, be interested in having your views on that. Thank you. And Simone Rivabera. Hello, thank you very much for uh, for this very interesting presentation. I have a question about what you mentioned on uh, the import importance of protecting the independence of the judiciary in EU countries. I wanted to know whether the EU Commission is also looking at prosecution services and uh, their independence from uh, the national executives and the legislature. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Commissaire, uh, pour la parole pour ces quatre questions. <laughs> Merci, mais je vais reprendre un peu dans, dans l'ordre. No, first of all, I have said that uh, with the uh, rule of law, we want to have uh, an equal treatment for all the member states. So, of course, we we'll express uh, every year our concerns about the evolution in the 27 member states, uh, funding members or new members in the last years or, or the last decades. Uh, in relation with the enlargement uh, year after year. And so also in the situation uh, in France, we have said in the last days that, uh, of course, we are analyzing the situation with a new law because you know that uh, it's not a tradition for the Commission to say something about a draft 
law. We tried to wait at the final decision. You know that there's a process in France with two assemblies from the, the, the Assemblée Nationale to the Senate and then go back. But of course, we are uh, for the moment in discussion to receive more information because it's very important to show that we are organizing exactly the same treatment for all the member states and we need to receive information about the full respect for the freedom of, of the press, the freedom of uh, uh, the expression, in fact, of uh, many actors and the proportionality again and the uh, necessity of some measures taken by the authorities. And so again, uh, in the case of such a law, it will be a part of the discussion and maybe for the next report, but we are starting now already. Uh, the preparation of the preparatory works for the second report of next year, we are in, in discussion on this, it will be important to uh, discuss about the responsibility of the law enforcement authorities. In the checks and balances, it's a uh, part of the discussion in many member states. Of course, we need to give uh, some capacity to act to the law enforcement authorities, but what are the mechanisms to organize a real responsibility of the uh, uh, law enforcement authority. So again, we will uh, organize a set treatment for all the member states and we try to receive information about the, the situation now with the new law in, in France and we have, we'll have it analyzed, but we have already uh, publicly uh, said that uh, it's very important to us to have a real protection of the freedom of expression, the freedom of press in such a, a kind of a situation. And we are knowing that the situation is not uh, easy if you look to uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the demonstrations uh, in the last years. But again, it's important to, to have such a kind of discussion. About the uh, EPPO, I want to insist on the fact that uh, it was maybe the beginning of the discussions on the uh, conditionality, uh, because due to the fact that Hungary and Poland have decided to stay out, and not only Denmark, Sweden and Ireland for other reasons, uh, it was important to start a discussion about the conditionality, and it was at the same moment that uh, uh, due to the fact that the PPO was only with 22 uh, member states, it was needed to, to install something else. But it was also very important to, to organize the process, not only with the 22, because uh, the uh, European Public Prosecutor Office become to be an authority for the good cooperation in criminal matters, not only with the other member states, but also with the third countries. So, of course, we will insist on the fact that it's needed for the justice systems in Hungary, in Poland, but also and everywhere in the world, uh, it will be important for all the justice system to organize a good cooperation with the PPO. The PPO, it's in line with the Convention of the Council of Europe, become to be an authority for the real cooperation in criminal matters. And so it will be important to have a recognition of that in the, the other member states and in many third countries. So we'll organize uh, different arrangements between the EPPO and the national authorities. But of course, <laughs> to be sure that we will have a real uh, action against the different uh, fraud, abuses or corruption cases in relation to the, with the European budget, we need to be sure that in those member states we have an independent justice system. Of course, if we don't have, you may have an arrangement, but if they don't have the real uh, uh, freedom to act, it's become to be uh, difficult. And uh, I want to take maybe uh, in the same way the, the last question about the, uh, the prosecutor, the prosecutor offices in the uh, European Union. Of course, we have raised concerns in the um, uh, member states and in some member states, uh, there's a lot, about the fact that sometimes it's possible to have some requests come the government to the prosecutor office and to ask to, to act. Uh, in different cases. The problem is to see what are the safeguards in the law about that, what is the use of such a possible injunction right from the uh, um, government uh, executive branch uh, to the, the prosecutor office, and we have put emphasis on this in the different report on the different member states, to say in some cases there's no use or there are enough safeguards in order we have some concerns. And I know, to give an example, there are huge debates about that. Uh, we don't have many concerns about the, the situation, to give an example, in Germany. But there is a debate in the German parliament. And we have seen already some amendments that were rejected. But to see if it's possible to change the law, because there is a possible link between the uh, executive branch and the prosecutor office. And uh, we need to continue to monitor that, to see uh, is it possible in such a, a way to have a, a possible uh, relation between the executive branch 
and the prosecutor office, but with enough safeguards and with enough uh, guarantee that it will be not used for other reasons that a criminal uh, policy in the country. And it's in the annual report. If you take attention to different national reports, you will see in many different reports we have put emphasis on this and we try to describe the exact situation. About, the, again, uh, the good step that we have set that we have now maybe uh, a conditionality uh, uh, in the budget and the rule of law. Uh, the most important element is, of course, to make the link between the budget and the possible uh, criticism about the breaches or deficiencies in the rule of law. But again, to give the, the most evident example, uh, if you don't have an independent justice in one member state, it's very difficult to say that you have a good protection of uh, the rule of law and, of course, a real protection of the budget. Because how it's possible to be sure that you will have some in investigations first, maybe, and then some prosecutions in the case of deficiencies uh, in the way to use the open budget without a real independence of the justice system. So, of course, we need to prove a link between uh, the, uh, the open budget and the possible breaches to the rule of law. But they are not just direct link in some specific situation. There are also a gen possible general links between, again, the independence of the justice system or a good framework to fight against the corruption and the possibility to have a correct use of uh, EU uh, funding. And it's the reason why it's so very important in the rule of law report to put at the beginning of the different chapters the different standards that we are using to have a good definition of the rule of law. When you speak about independence of the justice system or when you speak about media freedom, what that means? And of course, the standards are in the treaties, the Article 2, the most evident example, in the case law of the EU uh, Court of Justice, or the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, but also the case law from the European Court for Human Rights in uh, Strasbourg, and sometimes decisions coming from the Council of Europe. And it's possible to show that with some deficiencies, we have a real problem uh, with the rule of law in one member state having an influence on the use of the budget. And uh, to, to conclude on this, I want to say that we have already some problems and concerns about uh, those in relation with the independence of the justice system, because you have seen maybe in the application of the European Arrest Warrant, we have for the moment some refusals to surrender people to another member state uh, due to the so-called lack of independence of the judiciary. And so if uh, we have said at the beginning, you have said that also, it's a question of trust. If we don't use uh, a real kind of mechanism to emphasize the, the full respect of the rule of law, we'll have a lack of trust between member states, between justice systems in the member states, between citizens, between businesses, and so it's a real protection. But of course, it's also a protection for the taxpayer, because we are asking uh, to many taxpayers in Europe to show more solidarity with the more affected countries and regions in Europe by the pandemic and by the crisis. But of course, if we want to receive such a kind of solidarity, we need to show that we are protecting their money against, again, fraud and uh, other kind of crimes with the PPO, but so against uh, some uh, deviations and deficiencies in relation with the rule of law, that their money is used in region and country sharing the same values and sharing the same kind of principles. So it's very important to, uh, to work on it. Monsieur le Commissaire, sans vouloir abuser de votre temps, nous avons encore deux dernières questions. Allons-y. Euh, Laura Schmer euh, et Robert euh, Stefano Sifugoya. Yes, thank you. I would uh, like to uh, ask another question um, more on the content or the methodology of the rule of law report. Um, so some have argued that um, the report um, by putting a big emphasis on, on judicial reform uh, in the member states um, would follow somehow um, an underlying assumption that the organization of uh, the judiciary is um, the source of its independence and um, that this assumption would be um, contrary to academic evidence that um, however that Rather, uh, the um, independence of judiciaries stems from historical uh, 
historically developed power balance in every member state um, and not from specific uh, constitutional, constitutional arrangements. Uh, and I would like uh, to know what your opinion is on, on um, such observations. Thank you. Merci, Laura. Uh, Robert, uh, Stéphane? Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation on, on the rule of law. Uh, my name is Robert Goya and I'm reaching out on behalf of the European Citizen Initiative uh, Voters Without Borders, uh, as well as I'm also a student in KU Leuven. A couple of months back, in 27 September 2020, Romania was organizing its local elections, for which I have written a letter to you to inform the European Commission about the peculiar organization of these elections. As during the pandemic times, the freedom of movement is restricted for everyone, including the European mobile citizens, as well as the temporary or seasonal mobile citizens. In the letter, we have addressed the issue of voting rights with regards to the Romanian mobile population within the EU, including those that are temporarily residing in the EU. As these people had their right to vote denied according to the following EU laws, such as the Council Directive 9480 of, the, uh, of 19th December, December 1994, which lays down the arrangement for the exercise of the right to vote in municipal elections by citizens of the Union residing in a member state that we, of which they are not nationals. As well as, whereas uh, Article 8b, Paragraph 1 of the Treaty of the EU recognizes the right to vote in the member state of residence without actually substituting it for the right to vote in the member state where the citizen is a national. In this regard, um, the Romanian Senate has blocked postal voting for these elections, and my questions are the following. Do you think this may constitute a violation of the EU law? And are you interested in investigating this case further? And my only question relating to the rule of law report is that when we regard the massive voting queues uh, for citizens living abroad, such as the Polish presidential elections later uh, earlier this year and the European uh, European Parliament elections on behalf of Romania, the voting queues over there. Uh, shouldn't political rights situation in the EU constitute a part of the rule of law report? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. No, thanks for, for the, the two questions. I will start maybe with the second one uh, and to go back to the, the report uh, with the first question. Uh, of course, you know that the organization of the elections is a national competence. So we uh, have the possibility to make some remarks, maybe also to, to try to see if there are some violations of different elements of the EU law. But uh, we have had uh, local elections during the pandemic, not only in Romania, so in France, uh, so in Germany. And uh, the, the problem is to see if it's possible to have a fair uh, process, so to have a fair campaign, to have a correct uh, organization of the elections. Also during the pandemic, and you have seen it in France, it was possible to decide to postpone the second round due to the pandemic. And uh, we have di had different discussions on this. So, of course, first of all, we try to see if there are some violations or possible violations of the EU law. And we are very open to, to continue such a kind of discussions. We have mentioned some reference to the legal basis. But I want to take the, the most prominent example. Uh, it's also possible to have an influence in the way to organize the elections, also if it's a national competence. In Poland, you have mentioned also the presidential election in Poland. We were not alone. I have said that it was maybe better to wait, because during the pandemic, it was very difficult to organize the elections. Uh, and not only uh, due to the fact of the whole situation, but also to the fact that due to that, in Poland, we decided to use postal vote and not uh, to have a physical presence uh, to, to vote in the different uh, municipalities and, and cities. And uh, it was the same from other organizations, from the Council of Europe, from uh, other kind of uh, ODIR, to give an example, I've said or so that they had some concern. And at the end, it was possible with a debate also, first of all, in Poland, to postpone the electoral process. And you have seen that the electoral process was maybe uh, better later than it was possible to do sooner during the pandemic. And due to what? A fair campaign or a more open campaign. I have had contacts like others with the different candidates. It was possible to have a fair campaign. I don't want to start a new debate about the content of the campaign. That was something else during the, the Polish elections. And then it was possible also to organize the, 
the voting process, not only by postal services, but with other means. And so it's possible to have an influence on this. But again, the organization of the election is first a national competence. And it's the reason why we will come with a, a democratic action plan at the end of the year, uh, next month, to, to be sure that it's possible to make some focuses on this. And we try also to monitor the, the situation at the EU level for the European elections, because we have had also some concerns in the last uh, uh, European elections. We have published a report on this, and we try to see how it's possible to uh, have a better organization in the future. But again, on the local elections, we are very open to continue to, to, uh, to analyze the situation to see if there are some uh, elements to put in the, uh, the democratic action plan about the fact that uh, there are maybe some principles uh, to have in, in the mind when we organize uh, elections, because again, we are working on the, the rule of law in the annual report, but we'll have a so specific report on the Charter for Fundamental Rights, because it's another issue to have a real protection of fundamental rights, and we want to come with a democratic action plan, because we need also to assess the situation about the elections and the electoral process and the campaign and the way to organize a better democratic process with a better participation of the citizens. About the content of the rule of law report, I want to say, first of all, why um, it's so important to have a chapter, and the first chapter, about the independence, the quality and efficiency of the justice system. I said in my introductory remarks, because to my mind, but I'm, I'm sure it's true for all the different uh, uh, people involved in the process, is the most important element if you want to uh, organize the rule of law. If you want to, to see the society managed by the law, it's very important to be sure that it's possible to go to justice to ask a correct application of the law by the authorities, by the citizens, by the businesses, by all the different actors on an equal basis. And the independence and the quality of the justice system to do that. That's the first element. Of course, we have put also in the report all the chapters, but uh, I want to say that uh, the most important element is to be sure that we have a real independent and qualified justice system and efficient I spoke about the uh, digital tools that is needed to introduce more and more the justice system uh, to, to have a real protection of the rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy. Because if you don't have a good functioning of the justice system, you don't have such a capacity. But you, say also, you said also, of course, there are different uh, historical uh, evolutions and so on. Of course, we are not just analyzing the uh, legal reforms and the different laws in application. We try to put that in a context. I want to give an example. I said I was uh, in discussion with the Danish parliament some days ago. Denmark is on the first rank in all the different uh, rankings at the EU level and at the uh, worldwide level about the fight against corruption. It is very strange because they don't have so many legislations on this. And so they receive, I've said that, some criticism from the Greco in the Council of Europe about the fact that you don't apply the international standards in your law. But of course, you have a very good success if you look to the situation. So we need all the time to take into account, of course, the legal evolution in the different member states and the reforms, like you said, the reforms in the justice system. But we need to put that in a global context, of course, explaining what the situation is exactly like I said for the corruption in Denmark. But it's the same for the um, control of constitutionality of different laws. There are different mechanisms in Europe. And sometimes it's more efficient with a constitutional court or a Supreme Court. Sometimes without, it's more efficient. But so we need to put also all the elements in a global context. And historical uh, evolution is also very important, of course. But uh, at the end, the most important element is to uh, fulfill all the criteria, to have full respect for the standards that we have put in the treaties, again, in the case law of the Court of Justice, in the case law of the Court for, European Court for Human Rights. That's the most important element. And I want just to give an example. Uh, we have different culture, different uh, vision on different uh, issues in Europe, and it's normal. We are not all the same in all the different member states. But we have many difficulties for the moment to have a correct ratification by all the member states of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, first of all, about the domestic violence. And I agree that we may have different visions on the family law. It's true, we have had many discussions in Europe about that in the different member states. 
it's true that we may have maybe another vision about the composition of the family and the rules about that and the adoption and you know the, the discussions in many member states. But when you speak about the violences against women and children, it's a crime. And so I've said, if it's impossible to uh, go to a real ratification by all the member states, why not a new instrument at the EU level, at least to fight against violences and domestic violence? And I'm saying that because you know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an increasing of the domestic violences. And so the argument of a different culture, a different historical evolution is logical, it's true, but with limits. And so we need to put all the reforms and all the system in the global context to analyze the situation. And we are doing that in the report. But we need also to explain that sometimes there are some limits in the way to use the historical or cultural agreement, uh, argument. Because if you have, again, like we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, more and more domestic violence, you need to fight against a crime. And the vision of the family has nothing to do with violence against women or violence against uh, children. So just to give an example about the situation, because you know that we don't have for the moment, we want to have a ratification by uh, the AU, but we don't have the capacity to ratify the Istanbul Convention in all the different member states. Maybe with real debates and some elements, but certainly not about uh, the violence. Just to, to explain it. And again, when we, we discuss about the rule of law, it's very important to take into account the context and to put uh, together different elements and not just because sometimes uh, I want just to, to say that in a final word. Sometimes I receive a sort of criticism that we have put emphasis on such a point in one member state, but not so much in the others. But of course, again, we need to see if there is a real concern due to a specific point in a global context or not. And uh, we have had the discussion just before about the link between the the executive branch and the prosecutor office. Of course, that depends from the safeguards and from the way that it's possible to use that. And we need, of course, to verify that on the ground and not just in the legal uh, basis. So you're right. Uh, we need to take into account the different culture, the different situations in the different member states. But at the end, we need to ask to all the member states to fulfill all the criteria and to apply the same standards. But thanks again for such an opportunity to to discuss with you. I'm hoping that we will have the opportunity to do the same maybe in the near future with a physical presence uh, with so many uh, uh, people in front of us. Et nous allons certainement vous inviter, euh, nous espérons en présentiel euh, à l'Université libre de Bruxelles. Nous arrivons à la fin de ce dialogue qui a été extrêmement riche et qui a couvert euh, toute une série de thèmes euh, d'intérêt pour nous tous, étudiants, membres du corps académique, participants et des, des alumni de l'Institut. Monsieur le Commissaire, nous vous remercions pour le temps que vous nous avez accordé et pour ce dialogue qui était très important pour, pour nous à la fois, mais aussi pour, pour, pour nos étudiants. Nous espérons avoir l'occasion de vous rencontrer aussi et de vous accueillir à l'Université libre de Bruxelles prochainement pour un autre débat. Je vous I would like to thank also the participants uh, to this uh, event, uh, not only our students following the Jean Monnet activities, rule of law and mutual trust in global and European governance, but also students from the five universities uh, who are involved in the activities of the other Jean Monnet network, Open EU debate coordinated by Professor Ali, uh, Elena Garcia and Professor Luis Buza from uh, University Autonoma Madrid. Thank you very much to all of you for this uh, dialogue and for this very rich exchange um, of uh, views. Portez-vous bien, tous et toutes. Stay strong and healthy. And see you soon to the next activities of the Institute for European Studies. Thank you very much, Monsieur le Commissaire. Merci beaucoup encore une fois. Merci à tous et à toutes. Et à bientôt. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Bye bye.